up in front of all these wonderful, brilliant people. So this is a epic. I am Travis Wright. I live in Kansas City, Missouri. So uh, long ways away. Give you a little lowdown of who I am. Um, actually, I was a radio disc jockey at the age of 13, and I was there for about two years. That was as long as I could handle country music. It's horrible. I said, I got to get out of here. This is awful, especially 80s country music, right? So I have done a stand-up comedy since 1995. I quickly realized I was not nearly as funny as I thought I was, so I better figure out this internet thing. So I started doing web development back in 96, and I helped roll out GTE Super Pages, which was an internet directory in the US back in 97. And uh, I started doing SEO and geo-targeting of websites before actually Google was a thing. So I said, hey, if you're in Kansas City, or if you're in Brisbane, and you're a plumber, boy, you should get that .com. KansasCityPlumber.com would be awesome. So I was really consulting with a lot of uh, small businesses early on about what they needed to do. And uh, I am a former uh, Russian linguist in the military, military intelligence in the US. So the rest of the presentation will be in Russian. Здравствуйте, как дела? Что ты делаешь сейчас? Как вас зовут? Меня зовут Travis. Is that good? We're good? No? All right. I won't, I'm not going to try to speak in Australian either because my I've learned my accent's pretty horrible. So, all right. I am the former global social media strategist with Norton and Semantic, and uh, actually, you'll have the pleasure of uh, having my 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 boss was actually will be speaking on Wednesday. So this is awesome. We got a bunch of Semantic people here. Uh, I am the chief marketing technologist at a company called CCP Global, based out of Kansas City, Chicago, and San Francisco. And I'm a tech journalist. I write at a lot of different publications, CMO.com, TechCo, Marketing Land. Um, I'm also an Inc. Magazine columnist. I write on tech tools for entrepreneurs. So I see a lot of really cool tools. I demo a lot of tools. I see how they work in the whole marketing stack. And so I'm going to share some of those findings with you guys. So real quick, who is Travis Wright not? I am not Penn Jillette. I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys know who Penn Jillette is. He is a... Uh, He's a magician in, uh, in the States. So just, just to honor that, I will go ahead and do a magic trick for you. There you go. Nice little magic trick. A little fire to start the day. Here we go. All right. Where's the clicker? Here we go. So this is interesting. So I was actually on the phone paying a bill a couple months ago, and somebody goes, do you know you sound like Penn Jillette? And I was like, what? People tell me I look like him. Now I sound like him. And Penn Jillette was like, you're a lucky bastard. So he was, really, he was really pleased with that. So here's actually Penn Jillette doing a mobile marketing presentation. So, uh, no, not true, not true. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about Bro just to start off with, because this was an epiphany that I had a couple of years ago. And uh, so revenue, all the revenue that we have is based on the relationships that we have with our customers, right? So I was thinking one day, so we need to optimize our business relationships, which is business relationship optimization. That is BRO, which is the best acronym ever. You cannot have a better acronym than BRO. That is the very best. Here is Edgar Allan BRO. There's no reason for this in the presentation. Here is Abraham Lincoln. Again, just for my entertainment. All right, I'm going to be talking a lot about a lot of different resources during the presentation. So seriously, uh, ccpglobal.com slash datasem. It's actually all lowercase. So I'll mention that again at the end of the presentation. So I'll have a ton of resources, including this presentation, plus a bunch of other stuff. All right, so back in the day when I was thinking about bro, I was thinking, so search and social, they're bros, they're really connected now, right? Content's very important and learning all the stuff that we learned from SEO and keyword rich stuff and we've applied that to content and social, right? So those are bros, but what about all this other silo and silos of data that we have, right? What about the web analytic data, tying that in with the social data and the ad serving stuff? And what about our print media and our SEM and the TV stuff? How, how can we get all of this data to communicate with one another, right? <clears throat> so we need to be more data driven. And so back in the day, we were, we were mad men, right? And if you've seen the show, you've seen that. They, they sit around, they drink their whiskey and their scotch, and they come up with great ideas, right? But now we have to be math men. We actually have to prove that our ideas are working, right? We need to take these reports and build this stuff up and, and show our bosses and, hey, look, see what's working, right? So we need to really understand the data, very important. And so I like this slide right here because it really talks about how data works and how analytics ties it all together. 
So if you look and you can see all of the different spokes that we have in our marketing channels, and these are not all of them, these are just some of them, right? So SEO and paid search and display and social, they're all combined, and in the middle, web analytics ties it all together. So you, know, so you want to learn how to ask the right questions, and you want to be able to integrate all these different marketing strategies. It's really going to help you in the long run. You want to optimize your marketing mix and then recognize and know exactly who your customer is. And you want, you, as, as, a, as a consumer, I want the people that I work with or the companies that I work with to actually know who I am, right? There's a lot of benefits with that. And so personalizing the customer journey is very important as we move forward in modern marketing, right? And you want to be able to to show the right offers to the right people at the right times, right? If the first offer doesn't work, you want to show the next best offer. Which one's going to convert based on the test that you've learned, right? So it really boils down to those user experiences. And you know, as a B2B marketer and a B2C marketer, there's a lot of different tactics and different channels that you can use. And so this is cool. This is a B2B content marketing by the tactic. It's really hard to see, so I blew it up and turned it over. So social media, other than blogs, that's what B2B marketers are using the most right now. And articles on your own website are next. And then you have e-newsletters and blogs and in-person events like this, case studies, videos, articles on other websites, right? If you can have other people talking about you and saying how great you are to their audience, that's a big win, especially if you get a nice backlink kicking back to you, right? So a lot of different tactics out there. <clears throat> So when we look about enhancing our marketing strategy, we look at all of the, buy, of the customer cycle, right? So we have awareness when we're trying to get people to, to be aware of our product, and then we have consideration, and then we have the conversion, and then hopefully they like what they bought, and then they want to advocate your product. They want to talk to other people about how great you are, right? And notice all the different channels right here. So display is really good for awareness. Native advertising is good for awareness. Affiliate marketing goes through two channels. Uh, paid search goes through three. Social goes through every one except conversion. So if you're in social and you're trying to show your boss, hey, well, how is social actually converting? Well, it's probably not, but it's very port important in the whole uh, the, the buyer's journey, right? SEO is good uh, for, the, for consideration and conversion, but analytics across the whole board, right? Analytics and data is very, very important, right? And so here's a great quote by Jack Welsh that I've interpreted. That, that works really well in this space now. So there's only two sources of competitive advantage. The ability to learn more about your customers faster than the competition, and the ability to turn that learning into action faster than the competition, right? So if you can do those, you can collect all this data, own all of your data, and then act on the data and show relevant contextual-based you know, advertising and marketing to your customers, you win. It's huge. <clears throat> all right, so here's the history of marketing channels. I like this slide right here. So, they say the, the oldest profession, way back in the day, so they might have been doing some advertising way back in the day, but technically, we have 1839. That was the first advertisement, right? And it was putting a poster on a pole. And it was illegal because you, you were spamming my pole. You cannot put spam on my pole. It's illegal. So that was the first advertising. And then as we've moved forward, we've sort of automated different processes, right? And so, you know, we can see here when it says the future, the future is actually the year 2007, right? And so here is now. Have you guys seen this slide here? It's like, poof, wow, look at all the stuff going on nowadays. And when you think about it, though, this is only 25% approximately of all the new marketing technologies that are out there. And it's, it's mind-boggling when you look at all these technologies. And when you think about them, you can go, wow, this is a little overwhelming. There's a lot of things that you need to know, right? And, and there are. But there's a method to the madness, and there's a lot of different ways that these pieces of the puzzle can work for you to really help you build out the proper customized marketing stack for your business, right? And there's some methodologies where you would go and buy one from a big company like an Adobe or an Oracle or Google, or you can build your own marketing stack, right? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think that's the best approach because never do you want to be fully tied into somebody else's ecosystem because then they own all of your all of your information. And if you go too far down the road with some of those companies, it's really kind of hard to unwind that. So you really need to have an independent buffer between those big channels. So all of these really cool technologies are out there. Some of the big companies are out there buying and acquiring some of these. In fact, there's been billions and billions of dollars spent buying these really cool technologies by the big dogs. So over time, we're becoming MarTech men and women, right? So we're not just math men or mad men. We got to think about all this MarTech stuff too. It's crazy. <clears throat> 
And so you guys have probably heard this before, but by the year 2017, the CMO will spend more than the CIO. Well, newsflash, that's already here. This is, this is already happening. How many CTOs and CIOs do you know that are buying huge server farms for your company? Most of that stuff's moving to the cloud, right? It's a lot cheaper moving in the cloud. So that's the Gartner quote. And we are, you know, it's mandatory that we mention this quote in every presentation about marketing technology. <clears throat> so marketing and technology are now bros, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about omnichannel, right? That's a nice buzzword. It's, it's thrown around a lot. You read it in the blogs, omnichannel. So it's taking all of this data from all of these channels and pulling it into a system so that you can identify that user when they're at these different areas, these different touch points, right? So maybe they're coming from a kiosk or an ATM or maybe mobile technology. Uh, maybe they're at a physical store, right? And, they're, and you're in there and you have the beacons. Hey, we noticed that this person is now here. Computers, right? All different social media, just one channel. So taking all this information, putting it into one place, creating a unified profile for each one of your customers, and then sending that out to all of your uh, different advertising uh, you know, places that you're sending your information to. But you want to collect the data first, you want to own it, then you want to act on it and send it out to all the different vendors. So that's kind of tough, right? There's a lot of people using lots of different devices all the time, right? I have my mobile phone, then I have my tablet, I'm watching TV, I got my, I got my Mac, right? I'm using three different devices every day most of the time. So how is, it's really tough to track those, but technology is now there so you can actually track that way, way more effect, effectively. And this is interesting, I just like to throw this in here because it blows me away how often people are checking their phones. I have to commend you all though, I've not seen anybody on their phone yet, so this is great. Feel free to tweet though at any time if the Wi-Fi is working, it's good stuff. All right, so with advertising we really want to move beyond integrated marketing. We want it to create, we want it to be cross-channel, cross-device. We want to be able to pull all that information in, and we want to be able to do real-time, one-to-one personalization with this data that we're collecting, right? And so, owning the data, very important. And you want to move beyond just optimizing. You want to move towards awesomization, which I love that word. Somebody came to me one time and they said, hey, are you done with that SEO project? And I'm like, no, I'm not done awesomizing it yet. And I was like, Ooh. Awesomization. All right. So when people say, what is omnichannel? So you've heard single channel, multi channel, omni channel, cross channel. Well, what are they? Okay, so single channel, that's basic, right? Just one to one. This is one channel the customers are experiencing one of your touch points. A multi channel is they're independently seeing different touch points. Cross channel is the brand is starting to connect the branding to the customer, but Omnichannel is, is the nirvana where it basically, the customer just experiences the brand, the same brand everywhere they go. It looks the same, it works the same, it's personalized, it's customized to them, which is what customers really want. You think that a lot of times people go, oh, that's really creepy, I don't want that. But it's like, I would much rather see ads that are relevant to me about stuff that I might want to actually buy instead of seeing stuff that's totally irrelevant to me, right? So people are using their tablets everywhere, they're watching TV, they got their second screen going. They're at the store, they're using their tablets, right? We got the Google Glass, right? Any glass holes here? Anybody? I haven't seen any glass holes in about nine months. It's really weird. It's almost like they're hiding them. They're like, I'm not wearing my Google Glass anywhere except in my house or while I'm driving so I can see what speed I'm going. All right, so let's talk about the marketing cloud a little bit. And so again, we talked about the marketing landscape here. And I sort of broke it down a little bit. It's, there's actually 43 different categories of tools that you may want to consider when you're building your marketing cloud, at least according to this document. I think there's actually closer to 52. But um, yeah, so a lot of different things to consider. So I took those out, and then I smooshed them all together and made a heart. Aw, because I love marketing technology. Mark, marketing technology, it's nice. And then I smooshed it together again and made a cloud. So now let's think about this. So they talk about a marketing cloud. What about there's, there's a thousand of these technologies there and there's, there's people in their garage every day creating new technologies and there's a Harvard grad with a great idea who's gonna build something to solve something, right? Lots of innovation happening in this cloud. And so the tech giants are actually acquiring marketing clouds to compete, right? You've seen all these companies. But what about that 1,000, all those different marketing technologies there? 
So what's happening is these marketing clouds are popping up. And what are they? Well, they are acquired, non-integrated solutions where typically they buy technologies and over time they begin to create a walled garden where they're not working as effectively with all these other tools and technologies. So that leaves a lot of technologies unsupported. That can be a little dangerous, especially when that Harvard grad guy comes up with this next really awesome thing and it doesn't work with your ecosystem, right? That's going to be really hard to unwind that down the road if you're just full on working with those. So you want to be able to assemble and build your own best in class, best in breed, your own marketing cloud. And there's some ways to do that. We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> so to build or not to build, Hamlet, it's my moment. So how do you find the best in breed? First of all, these tools are really cool and they're great and wonderful. But you have to have goals behind them. For first, you know, first and foremost, you have to figure out what is it you're trying to accomplish. So without a goal, you know, you're, you're already hosed. You're going to just buy really cool tools, and they're not going to work together, and it's not going to matter, right? So first of all, you want to define what it is you're trying to accomplish. And then you want to take a look at and see you know, which categories of tools might help you solve that. Sometimes that, that tool might not even exist yet, and that might be a good startup opportunity. If you're having a problem in your enterprise, there might be some other people that are having that problem in their enterprise. So there's always opportunities popping up in this space, right? So who are the competitors in that space? And if you use the right technologies, you can actually deploy multiple of these competitors at the same time, test them all, see which ones work the best, and then use that vendor, right? So testing multiple vendors at the same time is something you can do if you build a right marketing cloud. And another thing to really consider is, you know, who's the best person or team to manage these technologies, right? So what I would say is important, and what we did at Symantec, is you want to hire a coder, a, a nice programmer who knows JavaScript and understands the DOM and understands how browsers work to be on your marketing team, right? We hired a guy called, named Chris Zakharoff, who's phenomenal. We hired him over from Adobe, and now he's over at Insighton. But the guy was brilliant, and having a marketing uh, programmer and coder on your team really helps you. So if you don't have one of those, that's going to be something that you need because there's going to be a lot of things they're going to be able to solve for you. Something to consider because there's a lot of stuff out there and if you don't understand how the coding and all that stuff works, you're going to be hurting a little bit. So one of the things to consider. So marketing cloud, it gets a little foggy. And so I'm going to talk about Adobe. What does Adobe do? So here's the Adobe marketing cloud as it stands right now. I think they have another circle with a new tool on there now. They bought some new stuff. But here's where they are. This is how Adobe got to their marketing cloud. Uh, they spent $1.8 billion on Omniture, which Omniture bought Offermatica. Offermatica was really cool. They actually had the, the, the tool called Test and Target, right? And, uh, Offerma and then uh, Omniture bought them. And then uh, Dimdex and uh, Efficient Frontier. They've actually bought two different tag management solutions to try to figure it out. And they actually give tag management away because they want to lock you into the system so they can collect all the data. That's, a, that's an interesting solution that they're doing, but they've spent about two point something billion, three point something billion dollars on their cloud, right? And I like to call those the Frankenstein cloud, right? And this is the best GIF ever of Frankenstein's. There's four separate GIFs going on at the same time, folks. Be amazed, this is, this is amazing. All right, so what is Oracle doing? Oracle, they have lots of bank cash money sitting in their bank, right? So they said, hey, this marketing stuff is cool. Let's buy some shit. And so that's what they did. They have spent lots of money buying stuff. They've spent about $3 billion buying stuff, actually. Uh, Eloqua, great tool. Love Eloqua. Uh, Compendium, Blue Kai, big fan of Blue Kai. Great stuff. So they've actually been spending some pretty good stuff. But they're not done. They have no tag management system purchased yet. There's a lot of other stuff that they do not have on it to, to build a complete marketing cloud. So uh, still rather Frankenstein-y. Salesforce. Salesforce is very social with their marketing cloud. If you can see that, social listening, social content, engagement, social ads, measurement. They recently launched a, uh, an analytics tool, finally, which is great. So how much have they spent on their marketing cloud? They've spent about $3.5 billion on their marketing cloud so far, right? Acquiring, integrating, not so much innovating, because it's, it's hard putting all these pieces together. So again, Frankensteinish. IBM, same thing. Here's their cloud. They've spent bajillion dollars on theirs as well. 
So that's what's happening, right? So uh, Google's done similar things. They bought a lot of companies, and then they kill the company. And they go, hey, this is, we're going to do this, and then no, we're not. We're going we're to shut that down. So again, marketing space, really stormy. And they'll tell you it's rainbows. Those big companies will tell you they're rainbows, and it's unicorns, and it's magic. But there are storms, and there is lightning you must be aware of. Because it is scary out there. So how much have they spent so far on all these marketing clouds? $11.2 billion, billion dollars. So they find some cool tools. They say, hey, I want to own that. <laughs> and they buy it, and they try to integrate it, and it may work. It may not work within their systems. So I always propose that you build your own cloud. So how would you build your own marketing stack? Well, this is what your marketing stack would look like. You're going to need to have some different things, some marketing automation, a CMS. You're, you're going to need to have uh, you know, all kind of data warehouse, data management. So here's the main pieces. You have your marketing experiences, your marketing operations. You have your marketing middleware technologies and your marketing backbone platforms and then your infrastructure. Now, if you look at that um, marketing landscape, that's where that's pulled from. Those are all the different sections of that marketing technology landscape. So you can see all the different tools that are located in that. So when I say we want to build our own tool, our own, uh, you know, our own marketing cloud, this is how you do it. You say, well, you know what? I really like Omniture, and I like Test and Target, so I want to use that. And I like Blue Kai. I think Blue Kai is good. And I really like Silver Pop that IBM bought. I want to use that. And Buddy Media is pretty solid, and Exact Target's great. And I want to use a few over here in the marketing cloud. Well, that's what you can do if you use yourself a tag management system. So from my estimation, building your own marketing cloud through a tag management system is the most effective way for you to stay on top of it and be future proof, right? So if you buy a cloud, there's a chance that they can say, hey, thanks for all this data you've given us over time. For you to completely access this or for you to get a copy of this, we're going to have to increase your licensing fee. You can see that different things could potentially happen over that. So you really want to stay future proof with a tag management system. So it's the best Frankenstein. It's one you can love. It's one you build. It's great. Did you guys know Herman Munster? He was a uh, 60s or 70s uh, show there. I just love it. He's so goofy. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tag management. So tag management really brings order to the chaos of all these tags and all these technologies that are on your site. Because if you, you say, hey, I want to try that technology, that one, that one, that one, and you put it on your site, well, then your load time you know, increases, your slight la it's, it becomes slower, and maybe you don't put the, all the tags in all the right places on all of your 100,000 pages, right? So with the tag management system, you have one line of code. It's a little bootstrap JavaScript you put in the head of your document, and then that access is a management tool where you then deploy all your tags through that management tool, and it deploys on all your pages. It then keeps track of everything that's coming through, all the data that's coming through all those technologies. You then collect that. You then own that data. And then you can act on it later with other technologies, right? So all these different technologies that are out there, all these tags that are on your website, boom. You put them through a tag management system. So here are some of the ones. You know, you have uh, Tagman, uh, which Insighton purchased. Google, Tag Manager, they have a free version. Uh, Adobe has one. Uh, Telium, Bright Tag, which became Signal. So there's some different solutions out there, right? But what are the major pain points? I talked about a couple of them. So uh, based on uh, the 93% of the Internet 100 top retailers, they didn't have complete implementation of the tag. So they might have 100,000 pages, but who's the person who has to put that tag on every page if you don't have tag management? Speeding up your website, that's important. And also, if you don't have completed tag um, presence on, on all your web pages, then you're getting incomplete data. You're not actually tracking all of your information. And incomplete data can be bad for you because then you're under tracking information that then the data becomes wrong all over the place, right? Also, there was a lot of duplication of tags. There was times where the same technologies are deployed twice on the same page. So then what happens is your data is corrupt again because now you have twice as much information being collected, right? And it's duplicating all of that. In and so your data might be incorrect, right? And there's JavaScript errors to worry about. So by having a tag management solution, that really helps that out. Helps you collect all the data, and I think that's the best foundational point. So all these different technologies out there you want to try? Well, if you have a tag management system, you don't have to really, com you don't have to discuss this as a committee with your IT. 
Once it's deployed, you can test multiple tools at the same time. You don't actually have to say, hey, IT, when can I get this cool tool put on my site? And they're like, ah, I got to put it in Scrum. And uh, we'll get to it in three or four weeks. And maybe we got all this other stuff. We're deploying this. We can't get to it, right? So having a tag management system makes you more agile, makes you able to do stuff immediately and test cool stuff out. Good stuff. All right, so let's talk about a data layer a little bit. This is interesting to me. I love looking at websites from the data layer perspective, right? So here's AT&T, which is a top carrier in the States. And what I see when I look at this site here is that they're using, it's a very flat system here. It's a very flat screen. So they're not actually testing very much information. Everybody who comes to the site is pretty much getting the same experience. So they do have some different stuff down here that they might be switching out, but it's a very flat experience. They're not doing a lot of testing. Everybody's getting about the same message. Conversely, here's Staples, which is an office um, supply store in the States. And you can see here, they have all these different things popping up through here. Free shipping, all these different places where they can actually change the content based on the context of the customer who comes to your site, right? To be able to change stuff on the fly is powerful. So maybe, you know, uh, the certain visitor comes to your site and you're like, easier is not relevant for this customer. I need to flip this out and it needs to say faster for this guy, right? And so you can do that. Maybe, you know, if you're a bank and you say, hey, um, why would I give a 2% you know, interest rate offer for this customer right here when I know that it's, he's probably going to uh, be approved for the 14% one, right? So you want to be able to change the content based on the context of your visitor. I think that's important. Here's ESPN. So that's a big sports channel in the States. I think this is interesting because I look at it from a wireframe perspective. And you can actually see all the different areas that can be flipped out and switched out based on the visitor, based on, so the score changes, right, or something, they can, they can change all that stuff out, which is pretty cool. Here's actually Facebook. They have lots of different areas that they're switching out on the fly all the time, which is pretty fascinating when you look at it from that perspective. So what is the data layer? What does it do for you? So it really is the lifeblood for your digital marketing, right? And we're here at a symposium talking about data. This is actually my first symposium. I've spoken at many conferences, but never a symposium. I feel so classy now. I need some wine with my symposium. So <laughs> synchronize data definitions. You want to synchronize all that stuff, create one profile, and then be able to ship it off to all the different vendors that, so they all have the exact duplicate copy of that. So it's good stuff. Standardize that, control that data, how you're sending it to your partners, and then you have better visitor attribution, right? So you're able to determine where that came from, where that customer came from, what channels actually impacted them on the customer journey to the actually purchase and the path to conversion. Better insights. So here's kind of what it looks like. Before, you just have just regular data. You're sending all your stuff all over the place, right? But then you have a data layer. You're able to collect it all, put it all in one place, shoot it all out in an organized fashion, and you're also able to pull information back and keep building your data. Right? So you're working with different people, you're working with different companies, you're, uh, people have seen different ads in different places, you want to be able to collect all that so then you can just keep building that customer profile. Right? So before, this was very tough. You're not able to, you, you were missing data, you didn't have you know, all the ad impressions, you weren't finding all the social interactions, you weren't, you know, you, all the stuff was kind of disjointed, very tough to do. You know? But now, you're able to really improve that with, with uh, data ownership. So, Here's one thing that's really crucial about this. So say you're, you're dealing with a double click or using a different ad network over here. And then you say, you know what? I'm not going to use you anymore. I'm going to move over here to this other ad network. Well, what typically happens here in the past is that you have to start all over and build profiles from the very beginning. It's a big cumbersome pain. So what's important is for you to own your data. And then when you move to a new ad network, you can just pick it up and go poof. Here they are, right? And so that's way more effective for you in the long run because if you have to switch over and you don't do that and you don't own your data, well, it's going to be a tough, it's going to take you about another three, six months to actually to, to build that up. So you lose a lot of time and your, and your competitors win a little bit. So unify all your data at the source. This right here is Cowboys Herding Cats, which is the best gif ever, right? And the, the point of this is, is do you really want to get on a conference call with your vendors and say, hey, could you send me over my data? They'll be like, yeah, I'll get right on that. And they will not. I love this, though, here at the end of a hard day of herding cats, you get your ball of yarn, have a, probably a glass of milk. I don't know what they do. 
I haven't seen the rest of it. It just, it just keeps looping. I don't know what happens after they're done with the yarn. It's very frustrating. All right. So the data layer. So collecting and unifying all of this data is important. So you, know, you talk about, well, what keyword did they use? Or what campaign? What was the promo code that they used? So you know that information. And what browser did they use? You know, that's, everybody wants to know what browser they used. And the cookies, have they been here before? Are they brand new? How long were they on the site? You know, what was the path that they chose, right? So there's all kinds of information that you can get and collect about your customers. Not only that, you can also collect affinities on your customers. Like, so when they came and visited this product, they liked black. They liked to buy black pants. Look at this. Oh, they bought a black shirt. So maybe when they come to my site next time, I'll show them black, right? So there's so much cool stuff that you can do once you know a lot and build a lot of information on these, on these visitor profiles, right? And then what's awesome is you have this data layer and you have this unique profile that you can send everywhere, right? And so that's what's cool is you can send it back and forth. You're collecting data. You're sending data out. You're continually building that user profile on that data, right? And uh, it's like being a mad data scientist. It's massive. You get this awesome, great information, and you keep, it just keeps working. So marketing personas, right? People talk about that and knowing the customer. This is some of the stuff is basic for the advanced people here in the room. But uh, you know, Forrester is calling this trend the age of the customer, and that we need to be customer obsessed moving forward. It's not so much just to know your customer. We got to be obsessed about the customer to really make sure that we're giving them the best deals and giving them the right offers that work best for them, right? And so knowing your customer is huge, you know? And if you're in B2B marketing, these are maybe some things that you want to know about your potential prospect, right? Doing some persona identification. Lots of different ways you can do that. I like to interview current customers to see what's working and with them and do some A-B testing and, and, and really checking out the analytics. Here's a cool tool if you haven't seen this, if you want to do personas, it's called Up Close and Persona. And it's actually a WYSIWYG you can walk through and it takes about 10, 15 minutes to really build out a persona. But instead of avoiding it and saying, oh, I'll get to personas eventually, you can literally do it in an afternoon. What's their gender? What's their race? You know? What's their age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You go through this whole long thing and it builds up. What's their name? Her name is Nancy and she works in accounting. So you can build it all out. It's pretty sweet. Another really cool thing, I really love graph search. I'm a big fan of Facebook and Facebook advertising and micro-targeting. Never before in advertising could you be so granular in your targeting. You can literally target one person and advertise only to them. It is amazing what you can do on Facebook. So not only can you check out and say, hey, is there a plumber nearby, which you can, or say, hey, what's the restaurants nearby, you can. Or you could say, hey, who are my friends that live in Boston, Massachusetts, if you go to Boston, Massachusetts. I did say Sydney, but I only had one friend in Sydney. Hopefully I have more friends after I leave. Right now, all right. So this is pretty cool what you can do with the data from Facebook is you can literally create correlations in the data from the people that you're trying to target, okay? So we did this for for Six Flags, and we said, hey, what percentage of the people who work for Six Flags or like Six Flags also like Disneyland or like Universal or like Epcot, right? So you can go through and see. You go, oh, what percentage of them are what's gender? So people who like Six Flags, 38% of them are dudes. 20% of them like Disneyland probably because of Frozen. They're tired of their kids singing it. They don't want anything to do with Disney anymore. So another thing that's really interesting is you can start looking at different people, like what kind of cars do people drive that like Disneyland, right? It's what kind of candies do they like? Well, they like Kit Kats and Snickers and M&Ms. And so you can really go through and find some cool correlations in the data where you can then advertise in different places that you might not normally advertise because people who like this also like that. Really cool stuff. And that's one of the things that my company does. We would take Facebook data and really do some wizardry with it. So big fan of that. It's cool stuff. That's my plug. I flew all the way around the world for this slide, people. <laughs> all right. So this is also really cool, the things you can do. So imagine this. Software developers who like Star Wars and JavaScript and live in California. You can do that. You can really do some really cool HR stuff with them, right? And that's really cool. So uh, one of the, actually the companies that did tag management, they said they saw me do some presentations about them, and I was talking about some of the stuff in tag management. They go, 
So you do the social stuff. Can you find us some employees? We need to find some, we need some really cool JavaScript people. So we did some ads, ran some, just some, ran some Facebook ads for them just to find um, employees, JavaScript ninjas and stuff. And we literally found them three employees that were nearly $400,000 uh, in total salaries. And it cost us $209 in advertising to find them. It was crazy. So if you understand Facebook, you can do some pretty awesome stuff. Right, so that's bro fist right there. That's good. <laughs> Love the bro fist. It's a cat bro fist. That's pretty, pretty rare. All right, so, so next up, I'm going to talk. So I live in Kansas City, and our, and our team, our football team is not soccer. We have the American football, right? My team is the Chiefs, and they were really bad a couple of years ago, and they weren't spending nearly enough money on the team, and I was very upset with that. I was talking with a friend of mine who I've had since fifth grade, and he was like, yeah, we are not spending nearly enough money. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tweet that. So I tweeted this two years ago. I'm not much of a Chiefs fan anymore. Clark Hunt, he's the owner. Yearly $30 million under the salary cap is unethical. That's BS. I blurred that out for the dainty. Didn't want to cuss too much. Greedy owners can FO. I was very polite in this one tweet. It was, I was gentle, kind. I was angry. I'm a sports fan. I ranted, right? Uh, one tweet. That's all it was. I was done. I forgot about it. Notice the time. Where's the time? 7.56 p.m. Three minutes later, the Chiefs guy messaged me back and said, hey, it would help if you had your facts straight. It's your choice to be a fan. CC, get a clue. <laughs> Told me to get a clue. Wow. We have to watch this in its entirety. Because I was that surprised. I didn't actually see it till the next day at lunch, right? So this happened, and then I'm eating my lunch, and I was like, whoa, this is crazy. So, uh, <laughs> so I took a screen cap of it, and I took it out. I said, hey, it's good to know the chief social media team is ran by a bunch of immature teenagers. Fact, you guys hoard money, blah, blah, blah. And I was mad. Was you mad, bro? A little bit? Not really. Actually, I was like, I think I'm probably going to teach them a lesson here in a minute. Let's see what happens. And uh, then they blocked me on Twitter. So because people were talking back and forth. I have a lot of followers on Twitter. And so people were going, is this real? Did this really happen? What? What? The Chiefs told you you had a clue? How rude of them. You know, like they're horrible. And uh, so I was mad then. Once they blocked me, that's when I said, ooh, you wouldn't like a social media expert when he's angry. So what did I do? I put it on Reddit. You guys know Reddit? It's a really big social media site in the States. It's a, it's a social news site. You get to customize your own news. So it ended up making the front page of that site. I actually slowed it down and ended up crashing the site a little bit, which was crazy. And made the front page of Yahoo. Mashable talked about it. ESPN talked about it. NFL talked about it. Uh, it was insane. I was on the news. <laughs> the Chiefs told you what? <gasps> so rude. I'm like, I know. I was like, whoa, they told me to get a clue. Somebody made a GIF of me. So I have a GIF of myself on the news. Whoa. <laughs> so they apologized, which was very nice of them. Of course, I was blocked from them, so I didn't see it. I was too busy trending at the time. I was very proud of myself. So that's my little Twitter story there. So, uh, Probably ought to make sure you know your customer, right? Who are you talking to? So that was interesting. I did troll them a little bit by copying the NFL at the end of it. So that was my bad on that. But it ended up being crazy. So that's my cool story. And I love this. I love that collar. If anybody ever finds one of this in my size, please get it for me. I will reimburse you via PayPal. All right, now I want to tell you about something that worked out really well. So I'm coming, I'm coming to Australia, right? And actually now I'm here. But I, before that, I was going to come here. And so I tweeted about it, and I was chatting with somebody. And I said, so I really don't know what I need to do about my phone. I've never been to Australia. Do they have T-Mobile there? And uh, Kate, my friend, was like, no, but they have Virgin and Optus and Telestra. And I said, okay, cool. So what is, how does that work? Or Telstra? I say it wrong? Testra? Tesla? No? All right. So moral of the story is Optus was listening, right? Optus was paying attention. Optus said, hey, TW. What is up? Once you arrive, drop by and say hello. We will set you up for some yes, whatever that is. 
with our prepaid options. I was like, I would like more yes and less no. Thank you. And so I said, well, hey, do I get the cool guy discount? And they said, I don't know. Come on and drop by. You will see our gate, and uh, we will look after you. And it was incredible. So I said, all right, hey, you know what? Sweet, you got my business via social media nicely done. Consider this a conversion. I will be by. That was nice, right? And so what happens is I drop by the store. This dude, Jordan, I'm walking up, and he goes, Travis! And I'm like, what? He goes, Travis, we've been waiting for you. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, yeah, thank you for dropping by Optus. We appreciate you. And, uh, and they, they hooked me up with a little Wi-Fi device, right, for the time that I'm here. And they gave me a bag of goodies of ridiculous. They gave me beer. They gave me some Vegemite, which I will not eat. I am not going to eat that. They gave me some Tim Tams, which look good. They say that I should dip it in my Vegemite, but that seems ridiculous. Uh, yeah, and so they hooked it up, and it was amazing. I got some flip-flops, and they were just so friendly and nice. It was one of the best experiences that I've had with the brand across the country, across the, across the pond, right? So that was amazing. So big ups for Optus. Love that. So... Um, that was crazy. So personalization, that's what they kind of did. They said, hey, this is, let's connect this. Now, is there any Optus people here? Is there any? I don't know. My, I had a sneaking suspicion that they probably figured out I was speaking and maybe their boss was going to be here or something. No? <laughs> All right. So personalization. So people talk about B2B and B2C, right? Well, Bri um, Brian Kramer wrote a great book called H to H, Human to Human. And I think that's really what it is. It's not B2B. We're all people at the other end, right? And so, and, and most websites are really good at the masses and advertising to everybody, kind of like at and is doing. But they're very largely irrelevant to that individual user. So we want to get more personalized. And so that's how we can do that is through personalization and attribution and trying to figure this out. So we've heard about the last click attribution, right? So where'd the last click come from? Oh, so look, they searched Google and they bought. That must have been Google, did it. Well, maybe not. Well, look at all these other places. You know, they saw a banner on Yahoo. Maybe they read a white paper. They saw a couple blog posts. They saw an ad on CNET or a banner on Sky Sports or ESPN, right? So there's the path to conversion, right? To, and so if you're trying to attribute that and you're saying, well, where do I want to put my money for my advertising? Which one's working? That's where attribution comes in, right? And so maybe some of those are more important than others, and you want to put more money in different buckets, right? Because some of those maybe didn't work at all, but some of them did. So it's a matter of figuring that stuff out, figuring out what is triggering that customer and those customers to buy from you, and understanding that is huge. And here's another stat that just blows me away. U U.S. retailers lose $100 billion a year on poorly executed cross-channel marketing. And I'm sure that that's the same all across the world. There's just different numbers. But that's insane to me that so much money is being wasted. And so it's my responsibility. I am taking it on to help people stop wasting so much money. We've got to be smarter. I'm, I'm like a politician right now. Stop wasting money. We're going to do it. All right. So agility is important. So all of this really wraps around being agile and flexible and being able to, to move quickly in the space. So agile is nimble, limber, acrobatic, fleet-footed, light-footed. And just like this guy, even the big guys can be agile. Watch this dude. This is crazy. Big dude. Oh, yeah. Three, four, five. Oh, yeah. Six flips. That's amazing. I'm inspired. I'm going to do a flip right now. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I don't want to hurt myself. That would be ridiculous. I would have to sue Mark and Ashton Media. We don't have to do that. <laughs> All right. Here's an example of not being agile. This guy. Oh, oh. Oh, screw it. I'm just going to ride it up. That's cool. <laughs> I like it, too. He's all like, all right, whoa, oh, oh, wait. Do I have my lunch? Yep, I got my lunch. <laughs> I want to see the end of this one, though. Does he pinch his ass at the end, or does he get up halfway up? Because that would be really extra hilarious if he pinched his ass. All right, so summary here real quick. So what we want to do is we want to combine any solution and build our own open cloud, right? We don't want to restrict marketing agility by being vendor locked in to a closed cloud. So there is a reason why Google and Adobe offer free tag management systems because you get in, locked into their ecosystem. And again, very hard to unwind that down the road when they own all your data and they're tapped into all those tools. Sometimes they're not going to let some of the other tools in. So it's really important to have an independent buffer in between that so you can use all those best in class tools, right? So no single closed cloud can solve all your marketing problems. Plus there's innovations popping up all over the place. 
unlock all those options. It's going to fit your business. Take advantage of the best in breed. Right? You want to assemble your own data layer right? to unify and enrich your marketing solutions. You want to ensure that your, quality, your data is quality. And you want to be able to pass that to all your, data, to all your vendors. Right? Standardize that with the profiles. And you want to know your customer's journey. You want to establish a 360 degree view of them across all the channels and be able to market to them effectively, right? Knowing your customer is huge. We want to feel, we want to feel known. We want, like me walking up there and them knowing who I was, hey Travis, I was like, what? That's great. So you want your customers to feel that and build that one-to-one -one relationship with them. And so business relationship optimization, right? So and we, want to take we want to do it real time, right now. Manage it, real time, intelligent action, being able to make different marketing decisions across different channels and different solutions. And it's going to really improve your ROI. It's going to allow you to create a better deal for, or a better offer for your customers when they come to your site. It's important. And again, another amazing gift. This is so exciting. They're really excited about data management. I love it in reverse, too. When he puts his glasses back on, he's all like, Whoosh. that is great. All right. All right, I want to talk just a little bit. It says my time is up, but I'm, I have a few more minutes here. Just, we'll squeeze it through. Different marketing technologies. So we talked about all of these technologies here. And so if you're in social media or you're in marketing, maybe these are some of the ones that are relevant for you. So not all of them are going to necessarily be relevant for everyone, right? It just depends. Some of them are going to be more relevant than others. Here's a really cool tool if you guys are trying to do some A-B testing. Uh, Maximizer is a really solid tool. It's very similar to an Adobe Test and Target, but it does some really interesting things. It doesn't have the licensing pings that, that Adobe Test and Target does. And my company actually resells the Adobe Marketing Cloud, right? But there's some things within their licensing that, I, that I've, I've not really been a big fan of. Maximizer does a lot of really cool stuff similar to Test and Target. And Monetate is also a competitor of them. So they both do kind of similar things, uh, allows you to even do mobile uh, A-B testing, right, to see which offers and, and which, which content works best for the, for the right visitor, right? Good stuff. Demand base, if you're doing B2B marketing, this is a B2B marketing cloud that you guys should probably demo. Really cool. They do some really interesting stuff. Demand base. LiveRamp is um, it's a company, I think primarily they're, they're doing data within just the United States, and I think they're branching out, but a company called Axiom purchased them for about $350 million. And what these guys are is they take data from all these different sources, online, offline, on-site, off-site, mash it all together and help build uh, or actually help you send all your data in these profiles through their pipes. And their pipeline actually connects to all of the top uh, advertising display networks, all the top mobile display networks, all the SEM sites, all the uh, even some television stations. So if you get your data all in a row, collect it, own it, you can send it through LiveRamp and really connect really well with, some, with the US audience. I don't know if there's an Australian equivalent of that, but it's a really cool tool. Uh, Insighton's a company that I talked about. Um, they have that single line of code you plug into the head of your document. And again, this is one of the companies that we've found that's really good. Um, Adobe, T Adobe Tag Manager, that's out there. Google Tag Manager. Telium is another tag management solution. Signal is another one. Um, this is the one that we think that in the United States is, is really rocking it. So what's cool is they're not just tag management. They also have mobile tag management, but also they built a tool that allows you to recompile your mobile apps without actually having to take it to the app store. So if you have a big app and you want to change some content or you want to change the, the functionality of some of the app, you can do it through app libraries instead of actually recompiling it and, and hoping that people re-download it from the app store, which doesn't happen a whole lot. They've also built what I think is one of the coolest things in marketing technology right now is their Inform uh, solution actually is marketing technology analytics. So they can see which one of your, your technologies and your marketing tags are working, which ones are not, how slow they're firing or how fast they're firing. Are they pulling your data? Are they collecting the data from that? So the Inform stuff's pretty sweet. And then their activation allows you to collect all of that data. And then they send it through their data layer. So they have a data layer that they send that. And they partnered with LiveRamp to create those user profiles and send all that information through. So definitely something you want to check out if you're trying to build out a tag management tool. Um, know your elements. This is cool. This is Ghostery. So these are the top 100 tools or tags that are deployed, uh, different marketing technologies that are deployed across the top you know, Fortune 500 websites. Right? It's pretty interesting to see that. And so Ghostry, they're tracking about 2,000 of these marketing technologies right now. 
So say, for example, here's Home Depot. And here's a really good way to do competitive analysis, right? So if you're a bank in, in Australia, maybe you're Westpac or maybe you're um, NAB, one of those other banks, and you want to see what the other companies are doing, and you come here and you have Ghostery, which is a free plugin installed, you go, oh, they're using Adify, Adobe Test and Target, they're using Brightcove, Channel Intelligence, Crazy Egg, Critio, which is a sponsor, right? Critio. Uh, Data Logics, they're using Insighton. Google Analytics, Live Person, Live Rant. So it's really cool. Maybe you go to your competitor site, see what tools they're using. You go, well, pfft, what's legit? I don't have any idea what the hell that is. Let's, let's go demo it and check it out. You want to make sure that your competitors aren't getting an edge up on you with something cool you don't even know exists, right? So go check them out, see what's working for them. Observe point, if you do switch over to a tag management tool, you want to, you have all these tags on all these 100,000 pages you got to clean up. This automates that process for you a little bit, tells you where all those are so you can clean those up quicker. Cool tool. Another tool, cool tool for marketers is nerdydata.com. So you can take a snippet of code or a keyword or something, plug it into this database, and it will tell you all the websites that that's located on. Or you can find a backlink and send that up there and see all the sites that that, that, that link's located on. So that's a really cool, that's a free engine right there, Nerdy Data. Zapier, anybody here played with Zapier? One, two, this is awesome. So this is basically all these marketing technologies. A lot of times they don't speak with one another. Zapier actually has these different connectors that connect to all these different technologies so that you can plug information and pull information in. It's basically like building a custom API for all your cool tools and then you can have them speak to one another so you can pull data from one place to another. Really cool, again, probably why you need to have a, a coder on your marketing team, right? So it can help do some of this stuff. But it's really sweet to be able. So if I upload this on Dropbox, maybe it will send a note over to Evernote. Or if I tweet this or this thing gets tweeted, then we need to send a message on HipChat to our team, right? So literally hundreds of thousands of these different recipes you could do. It's all based on which tools your team is using. Great stuff. Importio, this is for people who are not coders. If there's some data on a website that you want to scrape, Importio is another free tool. Uh, you basically download their browser and you can go through and it'll actually scrape data for you and put it in an Excel document, right? Or upload it in a format for your database. So you can create your own crawlers, which is really cool with this. So that's what I did. I created my own crawler with this tool. It was not hard. And I went to all, uh, I went to a lyrics website and downloaded, actually scraped every single Beatles song ever, all the lyrics from all the songs that the Beatles wrote, right? And then we did a word frequency analysis on it to see which words were used more, most frequently. And then we built a custom um, a word cloud creator. And, and so this is what I did. Is I ended up building this right here off of the Beatles based off of the words that the Beatles used most often in their songs. And I was really quite proud of myself. I, uh, it's all pretty awesome. So I did add John Lennon and the Beatles and some words that were not. But the number one word in all the Beatles songs is I. So just so you know. And you, and she, and he, and so, and love. That's the Beatles. All right, a couple social media tools. All right, if you have, if you are an enterprise business or even an SMB business, all of your employees are on social media, right? So you want to find a, a way to uh, uh, round them up and have them tweet out and, and share your messages. Because traditionally, people will trust employees of a company more than they will trust the company's social media channel, right? So if you can round that up and then orchestrate that, that's huge. It's gamification of your, of your, uh, your social team. So that's huge. There's some really cool tools to uh, increase employee advocacy. Uh, BuzzSumo. BuzzSumo is my favorite tool right now. It's a content data tool. What BuzzSumo is, it has access to the whole entire internet. And so if I want to type in a keyword, I can then, say for example, marketing technology, it will then show me over the last day, week, month, six months, or a year, which articles were shared the most across social media, right? So then I can find some really great content to curate that I might want to share on social media, right? But then also every one of those articles, you can click on it and it will show who shared that article, right? And then you can sort that information by their follower count or their clout score. Crazy, right? And you can just, there's so much you can do. Or you can say, all right, Inc.com, which was the most shared articles in the past week on Inc. Or whatever, mag or whatever website you want to go to. And it'll pull that information back for you. Sortable and it's exportable into an Excel document. It's brilliant. I love it. I use that like every day. 
pretty cool stuff. And I actually used this. I was able to scrape articles from that. I said, all right, which was the most shared articles on Reddit? Or which was the most, what are the most used words on marketing technology, analytics, marketing, big data? I was able to pull all those words, do word frequency analysis on that to see which words are used most often on different websites. So I did that on Inc. And I said, which words are used most frequently in the most shared articles on Inc? And I was able to find that information. And then I leveraged that. And I've twice had the most shared article on Inc. Uh, with an article that I've written because I used this data to sort of help me with my content creation, which is crazy. So Reddit, these are the most used words on Reddit. Here's the most used words on LinkedIn, right? Job, work, best, interview, business, career, right? Pretty, pretty obvious with, on that site there, though. Cool. Another site is really awesome. Another tool is Track Maven. Track Maven is like marketing voodoo to me, right? So what it can do is it can track your competitors, every single social thing that they're doing on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, all of them. And it can give you a report on how they're doing, what they're doing. Not only that, it also shows you on your earned media and also the traffic and SEO, your email marketing, your display ads. It pulls all of that in and gives you competitive intelligence, which is huge. So you can literally track a, a company's campaign from start to finish through Track Maven. Crazy. Uh, Rival IQ, this is a quick tool. You can literally just plug in your competitors and it'll shoot you out a 100-page PDF or a PowerPoint presentation with all these analytics about what, what they're doing. That's interesting. So CEDO, if anybody here is doing social media selling or, or trying to connect with really awesome people on social media, specifically on Twitter, this is another tool that I use multiple times a week. So what you do is you put in conversational words and you type in the data of which words you want to listen for. Which words do you want people to be talking about? Then you also have words that are located in their bio, like I want to have VP or marketing or CEO or CMO in their bio. And then what it'll do is it'll churn out and find all these people for me every day. And uh, what happens is you go, oh, I like that person, approve. Then what happens is it will favorite their tweet, and then an hour later it follows them. Then another hour later it puts them in a list. Then if they follow you back, it sends them a direct message. And if they follow you back, you can send them a LinkedIn request. And if they, they kick back to you on LinkedIn, you can send them an automated LinkedIn message back to them. Thanks for connecting. It's so great to connect with you, first name. It was so, so you can literally do seven different automated engagements before you've ever even talked to the person and they're messaging you back. It's crazy. You, you got to be really careful with it because whenever I use this, I typically end up getting like 100 direct messages back to me like, Travis is so nice talking to you. Like, wow, I have so many emails, so many messages I have to respond to now. It's crazy. But the tool is phenomenal. Another one, Little Bird. This is basically an influencer tool. So you can see who's most influential amongst any tool or amongst any topic, right? So say, for example, marketing in Seattle, I want to find the most influential people that live in Seattle around marketing. But then what it does is it says, well, here's 500 people that I found that are influential about marketing in Seattle. Then it ranks them by who's followed the most by other people who are influential about marketing in Seattle, right? So it's not just who says they're influential. It's who, how many of these people follow each other and which ones are the most influential. Really cool tool. Data.com. Love this. This is actually how I got to write for CMO.com. Uh, I typed in CMO, found the editor-in-chief of CMO.com and said, hey, Here's some stuff I've written I would like to write for you. And then he emailed me back and said, OK. So I did. All right. So this is the periodic table of content marketing. This will also be in the deck. This is just really cool, just different, different words that all apply to, uh, to content marketing, which is pretty awesome. So coolness, good stuff. And again, here's some more resources here for you real quick. Jot those down. Here's some more. Go ahead and j you got jot, all those, jot all those down there real quick. So. That is why I have them all located right there. I literally have 250 uh, white papers and, and uh, definitive guides to different things pertaining to marketing, conversion, optimization, landing page stuff, all different things upon data and stuff. So there we go. This is mind blowing. <laughs> CCBglobal.com slash data sim. And the end. He needs to watch out for that E. He's running right into it, though. Oh, watch out. Oh dangerous. And with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you. Thank you.